All right. Okay. All right. Grab your notes. We're going to, we're diving in. A lot I want to move us through today. We had a powerful service at nine o'clock and I believe God's going to meet us here also already meeting us here uh, at 1030. So uh, we are in week three of a series. We're calling this series Reset. Say it. Reset. And we're talking about uh, our interior lives, our interior world. We're talking about our souls. And uh, for those of you that are new to this sort of conversation, here's the thing I want to say as a preemptor to begin to get us to think together about this. Um, Those who write about the soul, those who understand this and do this kind of work, tell us that the soul is uh, the basic operating system of our lives. So we might think of it this way in this language. It is, a, um, it is, it is like a, a computer program that runs in the back of our lives and we don't really think much about it until something happens and then we realize uh, there's a problem. And that's why sometimes when you come into a world like this, you come into a religious world, we talk about our souls And some of us, that's new language for us, a new conversation. We don't understand. We can be be a little confused. I mean, think about it this way. When was the last time you had a conversation with somebody about your soul or their soul, right? We don't. We don't have conversations about our souls. We have conversation about ourselves, don't we? Express yourself. Be good to yourself, right? Then sings myself. (laughs) My Savior God to me, right? How's that working for us? It's not working for us, is it? And uh, those who write about this tell us this. The soul, your soul, is the deepest part of who you are. It's the most real you is your soul. And your soul seeks full integration with your mind and with your will and with your body. When we run across a human being, we run into sometimes these human beings that that uh, just possess this depth and breadth of character. In our language, we will often say something like this. That person, that woman, that man, they just have a lot of integrity. You ever heard that word? Sure you have. What are we saying when we say that? Here's what we're saying. We're saying they are fully integrated. There's something about them, their mind, uh, their heart, their, their, their will, their body. They're just fully integrated. That's what it means to have integrity. Uh, your soul is the deepest part of who you are, and it's the part that, that um, manifests when it's healthy. It brings all these things together about your person into one whole healthy human being. Now, think with me about the opposite. When we are not healthy of mind and body and will, think of it this way, we are disintegrated. You ever met someone who says one thing but habitually does the other thing? They're disintegrated in their soul. When Jesus said, what does it profit a person if they gain the whole world but forfeit their soul? Um, Here's an interesting observation. That's not a conversation Jesus is having with us about heaven and hell. We typically think that. What good is a profit a a man or woman to gain the world and lose their soul? That's heaven and hell conversation. No, it's not. It's a conversation of disintegration. Jesus is saying, what good is it to to pursue all these things and at the end of the day, be disintegrated as a human being? 
And so um, this is a really important conversation. Now, it's important in our day because um, we, have this, we have this thing that's called social media. I don't find it very social. But we have this thing called social media. And uh, I was reading an article just a few weeks ago that said um, that uh, the National Pediatric Association is only, listen to this, only beginning right now to get their minds and hearts around the negative impact of social media on not only the, the mental well-being, listen to this, but the physical well-being of our young people, our adolescents, and our students. They're, they're, they're sounding off. They're putting up the caution flag. And they're saying, hey, we're only at the very beginning of understanding that. So, so here's what I would say. This is a really, really important conversation, but it's not just a conversation for adolescents, for those who are younger in the room. It is a conversation for you, but it's also a conversation for, for us as adults. I meet with people all the time, and at the end of the day, sometimes I, I walk out of those conversations, and I just am overcome sometimes with the emotion of how disintegrated we can be as human beings. But God is wanting to bring full integration to our life. So this is why the church historically will not give up on the idea of the soul. And so we're having a, we're having a conversation and we're using a 3,000 year old piece of scripture to help us discuss what are four of the natural rhythms that we saw Jesus embrace when he walked on the face of the earth that, um, that we can embrace that will help us on our journey, watch this, to bring a fuller integration of all of the different parts of our lives into one whole healthy human being. So we're having a conversation about our soul. And we're using Psalm 23 to help us. Now, uh, we started Psalm 23, uh, and I, we read it out of the NIV version, and all of you revolted. <laughs> and last week, if you were with me, I, I, I read it out of the, what I said was the King James Version, and you revolted. <laughs> because it was actually my mistake, it was the new King James Version. You guys are demanding. So today we're going to read it in the old King James Version. Give me a break. All right, let's stand together. Stand for God's word. This is his word. All right, we're going to read it. And and I'm telling you, because I'm doing this only because I love you, you better read this like you mean it. Okay, let's read it. Ready, go. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Are you satisfied now? Wow. All right, word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. What a demanding group of people. <laughs> All right. Now with that over. Um, so here's where we've been. Here's where we've been. The first rhythm we looked at that can begin to bring integration to our souls, our inter- internal world. Listen up. This is important. Is Simplicity. And simplicity is embodied in the phrase, right? Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And the basic idea behind simplicity is this. And there's a great quote that we've been using 
Diana's going to help me with it. It's from Dallas Willard as an author. And Dallas says this, life is not about what you achieve or what you own. It's about who you become. And uh, this is really, this is important to us uh, because uh, we live in a world that places an inordinate amount of pressure on our external world. How we dress, how we look, what we own, what accolades we can put together, all this kind of stuff. And this psalm tells us at the end of the day, that is not a worthy investment of your life. There's more to life than that. Man, I could almost stop there, close in prayer, we could all go home. I'm not, but we could. That's really important. And the basic idea around this is simply this. It's not that you don't own anything. I'm not saying go give everything away, but I am saying this. Be careful how much you own because the more you own, the more it owns you. It's true. So we have to be careful about that. That's, that's, that's just the idea. The idea is around simplicity. Uh, if we were to tap into this, if we were to pump the brakes a little in our lives and just recognize that this is really an important truth of life, we will all find better integration for our souls right there. Our souls will become better integrated just over that alone. So simplicity is number one. Last week, if you were with us, we toyed with this idea, not only of simplicity, the second rhythm is this. It's the rhythm of slowing. And we said slowing is cultivating patience. And um, a fuller definition of slowing is this, cultivating patience by deliberately choosing to place yourself in positions where you have to wait. How many of y'all tried that this week? You intentionally tried it unintentionally doesn't count, okay? Uh, I, I, I was joking with everybody last week and I said, remember in my, my neighborhood where I live, there's one way in, there's one way out. One way in, one way out. And every time I go to pull in my neighborhood, something pulls in front of me and goes slow. I kid you not, I, I was like on Monday. This is Monday. I just preached this on Sunday. On Monday, <laughs> I'm pulling into my neighborhood. You can't even make that up because I'm so spiritual. I used all this time for prayer. Put on a few praise tunes. No. Okay. Um, the idea behind slowing as a way to bring integration to your soul isn't that we just do things slower. P. Diddy just wants us all to slow down. That's, that's not really the idea behind it. The idea behind it is this, that when we slow down intentionally, we become more present to the current situation. When Beth and I were um, just beginning our ministry, we served in uh, Martin County for three years, and, and then we had Haley, our first daughter. And uh, we, uh, we had her in February, and in June we moved to North Florida, where I served uh, County, little county seat church, First Methodist Church, Monticello, Florida. It was a beautiful church filled with beautiful people. That, that church taught me how to be a pastor. And they were gracious when I made mistakes. They put their arm around me and loved me. They, they just, they helped me get it. But um, I was learning. It was the first time I was the senior pastor of a small little church, which meant senior pastor meant this. When the toilet was broke, I'd go fix it. When the window was broke, I'd go fix it. It was just like, it was that kind of situation. And I was, I was scurrying about. And I was running pretty fast. And my schedule was pretty full. And at night, our, our little girl, when she was growing up a little bit, and I would come and at night I would read, I would read to her. And I'm almost, I'm almost embarrassed to tell you, sometimes when I was reading, because she didn't yet know how to read, if she wasn't paying attention, I turned a few pages over. I know. I'm embarrassed to tell you that. You know, like, are you, what do you think, Haley? You know? And, um, and she never noticed. My wife noticed. Um, 
when we slow down, we become more present. And we become, listen to this, y'all, we become more present to God and to the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. There's a verse of scripture that Paul writes in Ephesians chapter two, which is a super powerful verse of scripture. Look at this. Paul says about humanity, he says, we are his, God's workmanship. We are created in Jesus, Christ Jesus, unto, unto good works, which God hath ordained that we should walk in them. One translation says it this way, that we, we are prepared for good works that God has decided in advance that we should do. So it says, it communicates this idea. God right now is, is tapping on our minds and our hearts. He's, watch this, he's tapping on our souls and he's inviting into us into his holy work. And when we slow down and get present, we can hear it. So see, this is important. Well, this morning I want to invite us into the third part of the conversation, and I, I want to talk to you about the idea, I think it's of surrender. It's the third rhythm that brings integration to our souls. Uh, we find it, we find it, for those of you who are interested, in the second half of verse three and all of verse four, we're gonna put it up here in the, in the King's English. <laughs> he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. If we could go back, Diana, one verse or one thing here, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. So what is this verse telling us about surrender? What is it saying to us? And I, I think, I think it's totally clear. Here's what it's saying. It's saying, you cannot be leadeth unless you first learn to followeth. I told the teaching team on Tuesday I'm doing this and they said, you're an idiot. I said, no, I'm doing it. You cannot be leadeth unless the first you learn to followeth. Translated, it actually means this. You can't be led until you follow and you can't follow until you surrender. Do you know what brings integration to your life? Learning you're not in charge. You know what brings integration in your life? Learning it's not about you. We have to surrender. You want to know a better term for surrender, one that we can understand? It's the word guide. He guides me by his namesake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, he guides me. He's with me. You ever uh, had a guide? I remember years ago, uh, my older or my my brother-in-law took his two sons and me, their favorite uncle, <laughs> their only uncle. Um, we went fishing in Alaska, and uh, we one of the places we went uh, fly fishing was in Katmai National Forest, which if you ever look at Time Magazine or you see those, you know, those Ken Burns videos of all of the national parks. They'll show you Katmai. It's the place where all the bears eat the salmon when they jump out of the, right? That's Katmai National Forest. We went, fit, we went fishing down in there, and we were walking with the guide one afternoon to go, and he said, I'm going to take you off, offline. I'm going to take you down to this spot where, where it's a little off the beaten path, but, 
but it's the best fishings down there. We said, ooh, take us. And we go down there and we, we're, we're, we're just going down some most beautiful area, one of the most beautiful areas of the world. We're walking down through this forest. And finally, he bends down, the guide bends down, and he picks up these two rocks and he starts hitting them together. And we're looking at him. You know, I'm a native, third generation native Floridian. I'm like, what are you doing, dude? And he said, uh, he said, I'm hitting rocks together. I said, I can see you're hitting rocks together. Why are you hitting rocks together? He goes, it scares the bears. I bent down and picked up rocks. You, you learn in that moment, like, it's really true, right? You don't, you don't have to outrun the bear. You just outrun the guy you're with. Like, I was like, I, can out, I could take my brother-in-law easy, you know? He guides me. Now, here's the idea behind what the psalmist is trying to get us to understand. It's really important, really important concept. We're all being led or guided by something. Uh, occasionally I run into people and they'll say this to me. They'll go, you know, I'm own, my own person, Pastor Dale, and I am in control of my own life. And I am ruled by nobody and no thing. And when I hear people say that, you know, I always think, first of all, I think there's a, that sounds really good, doesn't it? I'm my own man. I'm my own person. When Haley was little and we'd take her to preschool and we were in this uh, pickup group with all our little friends and one day Haley crawled in the van with this little boy and I was taking her to preschool and I could hear them having an argument in the back of the van and they were arguing like this. He would go, well, I'm, I'm the boss of my hammer and she'd go, I'm the boss of my crayons and he'd go, well, I'm, I'm the boss of my train set and she'd go, I'm the boss of my Polly Pockets. And then he made the fatal mistake. He goes, and I'm the boss of this van. <laughs> and right there, I learned my first daughter was a leader. And she said, you are not the boss of this van. This is my daddy's van. And he let me be the boss of this van. <laughs> And I went, man, there's a leader right there. And I heard the kid, he knew he lost. And I kid you not, I heard this little boy, he goes, uh, well, I'm the boss of my cat. <laughs> and I thought, poor kid, nobody bosses a cat, right? <laughs> you know? But I'll meet people and they'll say, they'll say, I'm the boss of me. But here's the thing I want you to know. Is that really true? Because all of us are the product of what, our environments, uh, our backgrounds, our compulsions, our beliefs or misbeliefs, our DNA. I have a friend who says it this way, Jesus lives in my heart, but grandpa lives in my bones. Rick Warren, when he was writing Purpose Driven Church, very fascinating, look what he says here. He says, all of us are driven, led, by something. Each of us have a driving force behind our lives. For some, it might be guilt. For some, it may be resentment or anger or approval or addiction or compulsive behaviors. But for Christ followers, our lives are driven by God and his purposes for our lives. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Who wants to miss out on that? But here's the question. This is the real question in the room. How do you get there? Even if I could get you to a place of agreement with me, the real question in the room is, how do we get there? How, how, how do we live lives of surrender? I mean, we could talk about it, sounds good, but like, how do we do it? I have an idea. And I want to walk you into something that I think is super, super powerful. And a lot of times, we talk about it on, uh, on, on an, in another venue, 
of our church, but it's important that we talk about it in this venue. And I want to show you, I, I think the way to get into it, first of all, I'm going to show you a picture. Anybody know who this is? Anybody? Uh, I think you'll know when I tell you this. It's Bill Wilson. He's the co-creator of Alcoholics Anonymous, AA. Now, let me tell you about Bill Wilson. An enigmatic character, a complicated man for sure. His story's complicated. Uh, but he had a compulsion. and It was alcohol. His parents abandoned him when he was a very young man. And it created him an insecurity that he found solace uh, in a substance. And it gripped his life. First time he drank, he's, he's, he's on record saying, I found the elixir of life. And it quickly spun out of control. And he had another friend who battled the same kind of addiction, but this friend... Uh, had a connection with the power of God through Jesus Christ in a group called the Oxford Group. And he got on top of his alcoholism and he never drank again. And this moved this man. And so he began to notice there was a, a spiritual component that would help us get over the addictions of our lives. Can I just frame it for you in a different way? Let me frame it for you this way. He was a very disintegrated human being. Get it? Get it? And so he developed a method. We know it now as the 12 steps, but of the 12 steps, the, the top three are the most important. And step three is actually what we're talking about in this room right now. It's the step of surrender. And it looks like this. It's called the faith step or the surrender step. And, it, and, and the bigger, broader definition looks like this. It is this, that we made a decision to turn our lives and our wills over to the care of God. Why? Because we're disintegrated. And we want integration so bad the soul seeks it. And because all of this began in the church, right, we now relegate it in, in many ways, and there's good and bad in that it's gone broad, but it began in the church and around the principal truths of the scripture. Here's the principal truth connected to step number three. It's simply this one. Therefore, Paul says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Surrender your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. The true and proper worship of Jesus is always like this. It's like this. So this is the conversation in the room right now. But what I want to tell you is simply this. That's step three. And the presumption of Bill and his buddies is you can't get to three until you identify with one and two. Now, don't miss this. Young people, you can build your life on what we're talking about right now. Uh, older people who are experiencing some disintegration, you can find integration right here and so Bill says there's actually some other steps there's step one and step one is called the reality step well what's the reality step Pastor Dale? here's how he said it we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and our compulsive behaviors that our lives had become unmanageable can I give you another definition this is the picture of a disintegrated soul there's some things in my life that I can't control. We all have them. We all have them. Uh, in fact, um, the verse connected to this, this, look at how powerful this verse is right here. Romans 7, 8, or Philippians 2, 13. 
I think it's, can we go to the Romans verse? Yeah. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. Can I get a witness? You ever tried super hard at something? Man, I got to get this right. I just can't. I just can't. Right? Can I get a witness? Two hands. <laughs> right? You're never going to get to surrender until you first go, you know, I got some stuff. I can't get my arms around. I keep doing stuff. That's the bad news. That's, rea- that's reality. But but Bill, here's, here's what's so powerful. Bill said, you want, to, you want to get to integration? You want to get to surrender? You got to understand the reality. You got stuff about you. Here's step two. It's, it's called, step two is called the hope step. And doesn't that even sound good? You should name a church the hope step. Okay? And step two is this. God has power to bring healing and wholeness to our lives. Uh, Said in his language, it was like this. We came to believe that a power, God, greater than ourselves, could restore us to sanity. What does that mean? God can bring integration to our mind, our will, our bodies. I was talking to Pastor Curtis guy on our team who I love, doing great work, learning the ropes of ministry. A lot of times when I see Curtis, I I see myself. And uh, Curtis, uh, I was talking to him, he has some experience in this area, right? And Curtis says, hey, Pat, I said, how do you think of it, Curtis? Am I got this right? And Curtis said to me this, he goes, well, in the community, in the community, we think of it this way. Step one is, I can't. Step two is God can. And step three is I think I'll let him. That's where we are. But you can't get here until you understand these things right there. I was thinking a way to bring all of this together And I thought of saying it to you this way. I think the bottom line on surrender is simply this. Until we fully surrender our lives to God through Jesus Christ, the idea of God will always be just that, an idea. Some of you are here and you're wondering, you know, why why is my faith, why is it not working? Because it's just an idea. You've never done this. I can't. I think part of worship every Sunday, I can tell you what it is for me, happens right there. It's me before God in my heart going, um, I can't. In fact, sometimes it's like this. I can't, and I didn't. I chose not to. I don't know why, God. I just chose not to. But then I remember he can. And so again, I go, um, I'm here again to let you. Have you done that? By the way, I don't, th- I don't think it's a one-time thing. It's a posture. You hear where I'm going? It's a rhythm. 
And when we do it, it brings integration to all of the disordered, disconnected parts of who we are. You ever done something and said, this is not me? It's not me. I don't want to be like this. I don't want to stay like this. That's the power of God seeking to bring integration to your soul. I pray you let him. In March, um, I think it was, February, February, I took part of my team to Wilmore, Kentucky. Y'all remember the Asbury Awakening that kind of just sparked, you know. Uh, I was doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. I was just bringing people in. And uh, I, they kept singing this song that just attached itself to my heart. I, I became, when I got back, I became a song bully. Do you know what a song bully is? You want everybody to sing this song. Sing this song. I went to Keith. We're singing this song. I've never heard it. I don't care. Sing it. And um, it's, a, it's a song about surrender. It's a prayer. And I'm going to let you have an opportunity to sing it to your Lord. And maybe some of you want to come to the altar. Maybe you want to do some business. But here's the thing. Until you surrender your life to the power of Jesus Christ, the idea of God will only be for you an idea. And there's just so much more. Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit and by the mercy that is in your character, would you meet us here in these final moments of this service and would you help us in your mercy to bring integration to all the disordered parts of who we are when we surrender our lives to you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. So I want to remind you of something. Right now, right now in this moment, every single one of us is being driven by something. Memory, habit, mistake, something somebody said to you, something somebody did to you, something you did to someone else. Your best intentions are beneath your best ideals. You'll never get there on your own. So you have to choose. And Jesus has made himself available to you by his mercy. Not out of any good thing you've done, but out of the richness of his love he has provided a space for you to escape that and to experience a full integration into one whole, healthy, holy human being. But you got to recognize your need. You got to recognize his power. And then you acquiesce to him. Lord Jesus, don't let us miss our moment. And this is big. This is big. Don't let us miss our moment. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Behold, I stand at the door knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and fellowship with him. This we pray in Jesus' name. 
I would remind you of folks here to pray with you if you need special prayer. If not, would you go in his mercy? Happy Father's Day. We'll see you next weekend.